Hello and welcome to the Helen and Kat podcast. We're talking about Helen's book, Love Will Do Whatever It Takes. And this is our fourth podcast. And we'd like to say thank you so much for listening and joining us on these podcasts because we're on quite a ride and we're loving that you guys get to share this ride with us. So hi, Helen. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we had a little talk before we started this just to look at what um, the focus was going to be. And the focus for today is um, the power of your thinking because I mean, this is looking at it from probably a bigger perspective, but there's a couple of things that started to happen to me as I was, um, not while I was writing the book, but while I was living what we're writing about in the book. Um, as soon as I started working on myself and doing something to better myself or understand myself, I started to realise that whatever I was focusing on started to turn up. So, for example, if I started focusing on spirit guides and you know negative and po positive energy and and even demons and um you know other ghosts and ghoulies and things it opened up some sort of door for all of those things to start happening to me um when I started to focus on learning how to read tarot and do readings for people I started to get really good at actually reading people so they're two big examples of the power of your thinking. But, Kath, you had a couple of, like, you were recalling where it sort of starts, yeah? Yeah, I mean, kind of everybody does this. Like, how often have you been like, oh, I'm just thinking about Mary, and then all of a sudden the phone rings and it's Mary, or a day later the phone rings and it's Mary, you know? Like, so it's like what you're thinking about is actually rippling out into the world and it's totally influencing your life. I mean, we've all had those sort of moments, um, and, um, yeah, I can't think of another one off the top of my head at a second. Well, thinking about somebody and you, you meet them in the shops. Yeah. Yeah. You bump into them. Yeah. Or I'm like, you know, when you're like, you can't find that thing in the house and you just go, you know what, it's going to turn up. And then all of a sudden it turns up. Right. Even though you've or turned it out. Another goodie is the car park. Everybody knows about the car park. They, you know, you want to go somewhere, you want to get that parking spot right out the front, wherever it's really convenient. How many times has that happened to us? That's right. I mean, people joke around, they're like, oh, I'm going to call out to the car park ferry. But you are the car park ferry, right? You're the one yeah. that's thinking about it and focusing on it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's woven through a lot of my story as well, as I started to realize that about myself, because when I, as I said, to start up with, when I started to work on myself is when I started to become conscious of it. I think that throughout my life, it had already been happening, of course, to varying degrees, but I just didn't notice. Mm. I didn't take any notice and I didn't put the, the two and two together. And I think I probably even just called them coincidences. Mm. It's like, you know, yeah, it's just a coincidence that I was thinking of somebody and they, they, turned up or rang me or whatever you know but when I started working on myself I became conscious of what was going on and through that consciousness or awareness started putting pieces together so when I started noticing uh, noticing it I was like what is this All right what, what's what's going on and how is it happening yeah mm -hmm. and it, I got past the coincidence because I'd start putting the pieces together, joining the dots, whatever you want to call it. I, I started to look at how often it was happening. And the more I focused on how often it was happening, the more it happened. <laughs> it's that never-ending cascade effect, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And hindsight is such a beautiful, beautiful thing because I think we only really figure things out when we look back but not a lot of people sort of look back and review what's happened in the last day or week or month or year or your life. And the book certainly got me doing that. Um, but when I'd look back, that's when I'd notice how many of these things were happening and how, um, how you know, they were growing. They and were it's growing. kind of like that whole looking back, I think that's been for me, like helping you with this book. It's kind of the greatest gift that I've got getting out of this. I mean, I'm going through transitions and changes in my life. But there's no point in going through those if I'm not actually going to reflect on what I've, what's happened and what I've done. 
Because otherwise I'm just going to blindly blunder into the same thing over and over again. And that power of reflection, it's so important because it helps us to get clear on what we're thinking and why we're thinking the way we're thinking, right? Yeah, it, it's it's like it's like um, standing outside of what happened to you mm. and viewing it from a different perspective. Yeah, it's much easier when you're not emotionally involved in that moment, right? When you're looking back and reviewing. Yeah, but my point is that you can't review at the same level. You know, when you review, you're looking from a different standpoint. Mm. Mm -hmm. Whether that is un unemotionally or clearer, you certainly are looking at it from a different standpoint. Do you think the review needs like a, like a period of time between events and review, do you think? Or like can they kind of have a cascade effect straight after each other? I don't know. I think that's it's it's up to the individual to figure that out for themselves. Because you know, I'm looking back at at how when I started reviewing, and I really can't put my finger on it right now. Yeah. What about you? Um, at different moments in my life, I've done review, but I realizing for me the importance is time partly and it's maturity and just experience and being able to review something huh, review review it sorry having an aha moment um from a different perspective of wants needs desires understanding clarity i mean maturity really um and I don't know, why, why are we we've never taught this? Like, why were we taught, like, okay, let's, we review for study for school, but we don't review for the poor choices I made in the boyfriends I dated or the friends I hung out with or the jobs that I did. And actually now I'm, I'm, I know how I review. I, it was, it would be when I'd catch myself repeating a situation. Mm -hmm. That's when I'd sit and review and I would look at how I had handled this situation before, the, the last time or the time before, and that was really asking me to consider how I was going to do it differently. Like, for example, I found myself when I first had a child um, saying some certain things to that child or even to my husband at the time and thinking, oh, shit, I sound like my mum or I sound like my dad. Yeah. And that's when I'd catch myself and go, I'm, I don't want that. So what am I going to do about it? Mm. So that was me reviewing, you know, like the, the end of the day or the end of the week and going, oh, gosh, it, that's happened a number of times and I don't like it. So that's when I would sit down and just consider what was going on and I'd think it through. So sometimes I've written journals and things like that and, and wrote it out somehow, but that, that was a time where I thought it out and I didn't want that. So I started asking better questions about, well, how do I change that? Mm, yeah. yeah. And as soon as you do, this is your thinking creating reality. As soon as I started thinking about how I could be better or how I could change that situation, along came some information about a parenting course. Yeah. And I happened to sign up for that course and go and have a listen to a few people talking about parenting skills and stuff like that. Mm. Um, Got to say that that did nothing for me because... <laughs> <laughs> you know, it just wasn't the right thing at the right time, I don't think, for me, because all I heard was wah, 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 wah. You know, I didn't I didn't really absorb the information. I didn't really get what they were all sort of talking about. But having said that, I certainly, you know, over time started to better my own skills. But that's like a valid point. Like, you know, you you, you said 
as, as a course popped up in front of you, you know, you decided you wanted to change the way you parented, then a course appeared, but you didn't really get anything out of that course. That's often we go, oh, well, and then you stop trying or stop attempting mm -hmm. things. But the point is, no, you keep going until the change happens, right? You just keep going until you find that right piece of information. And that's, yeah, I call it an until dot, dot, dot. <laughs> you know, and that's something that I'm really just starting to kind of understand because I mean a part of the problem is the quick fix mentality right we get stuck in a quick fix mentality but it's not until you take that little step forward sure you went to a class that wasn't great but it actually still you moved forward right so that meant new opportunities came in front of you because you took that step so well, I actually then knew I didn't have the answer, so I had to keep looking. That's how I've always worked at things. And it's, it comes to a really important point. I was looking outside of myself for the answer mm. and I didn't find it. Yeah. And ultimately the answer was inside myself. Mm -hmm. I had to review and I had to ask for something better. And I, as I dug a little deeper and a little deeper each time, I figured out I had the answers. I had to raise those kids the way I wanted to. Yeah. So I was just sort of breaking the cycle of doing things like my mum and dad because, you know, no judgment on them at all, but it's like it wasn't always the best. No. <laughs> and I wanted to do it a better way. Yeah. And the answers to that was inside of me. And I suppose just over time, because, I mean, you know, we're, we're in such a society that we think that when we ask for something, it should just turn up, right? Mm -hmm. But it didn't. It, it, it just evolved over weeks and months. Yeah. And I just got better and better at putting my own thoughts and ideas into practice and breaking the cycle of mum and dad. Mm hmm but the answer wasn't on the outside. Yeah. It was on the inside. And then as soon as we go back to where we started today, the power of your thinking, as soon as I started to think for myself, that's bloody significant, isn't it? Oh, my God. It's so hard. That statement, right? As soon as I started to think for myself, it started to turn up on the outside. Mm -hmm. Yep. So the change came through, I was trying to clarify that in terms of you had the answers and as you change the way you think, then it gets reflected in the outside world. Is that right? Yeah, and I think it's not about changing how you think. It's like there's layers of thinking you know, at first it was like, oh, I'm, I, you know, I sound like my mum or I sound like my dad or I'm behaving like them. I don't want to do that, yeah. right? So how do I do something different? That's the first step, you know, and then it's like, um, you know, another thing would happen and I'd be, I, it, it's the questions, it's the asking the questions mm -hmm. that gives you new answers. Yeah, okay. So it's identifying and then asking questions. Yeah. Yeah. Or experiencing. It's not even about identifying. I mean, I didn't identify it. I felt it. It was like, you know, sounding like my mum. <laughs> We've all been there. You open your mouth and your mum comes out and you're like, holy cow. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, society out there sort of says that that's okay. Um, and, you know, I have another point of view about that it, it it's not because you're here to be uniquely yourself mm. and I mean I certainly owned the traits and the characteristics that I had um, from my mum but bit by bit I surrendered them along the way because I was becoming me mm. yeah and and you know I don't sound like her I don't have mannerisms like her um, you know, I, I, I mean, when it comes to looks, I suppose people will see family traits and things like that. But, you know, I raised my kids completely differently to what my mum and dad did. And it started with those first few things of, mm -hmm. oh, my God, I'm sounding like them or I'm behaving like them. 
And I even said to my sisters, because there was a bit of a gap in, in age, it's like, you know, hey, I, I'm, I'm really clear on this now. Don't raise your kids like mum and dad did. Yeah. You're here to do it your own way because we can work out, this is evolution, we can work out better ways to do it mm. without having to yell and scream or hit with wooden spoons or whatever, right? Um, and the bottom line is they didn't. Yeah. But that's okay. Yeah. They're each to their own. But here we come back to where we started. It's the power is in your thinking. Mm. Controlling your own mind is really important. The mind has a wonderful role, but it's not about taking over and chattering to you, you know, 24 hours a day and, you know, filling you with anxiety and worry and, and problems. So how do you not let your mind take control? You start taking control of it. You start listening to it. <laughs> You stop, you start and stop listening to it? <laughs> start listening to it. You can't stop. You can't tell it to stop. Because it's a bit like telling a child not to do something. Then what happens? They just don't do it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's still a few adults around like that too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it becomes one of those programs out there. As soon as you're told you can't do something, oops, you want to. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that, that that's the mind as well. So we're not going to get to, we're not going to get today into how to master the mind and stuff, right? I mean, you know, it's more that what's been coming out is that your thinking creates reality. So you talked about that the cascade effect so when you start being conscious of what you're thinking about you start seeing it being reflected in the world around you mm. can you harness that like is it I mean it starts off it's kind of accidental right well actually I didn't say reflected in the world you did but it's a good point mm. I just said that what I was thinking about would start turning up yeah. in the world but there is another level to it as well and that's when traits and characteristics turn up in other people are they reflecting you mm. yes I always love the saying there's something about that person I don't like about me yeah but it's a real big pill for people to swallow especially when it comes to really negative traits or something to think that you know some I don't know, arrogant piece of work is standing in front of them and, um, you know, that they have to actually own that that's possibly them as well. <laughs> I know, it's so funny. But, I mean, it is, I think, the most liberating thing when you start to really own that too because it takes the power out of the mind chatter. Yeah. It does because it's a program that's trying to run. And when you actually own that you could possibly be arrogant, mm. it doesn't mean that you are all the time, but, you know, that you have been or could be. Um, we were talking about it, you and I, the other night that, you know, I, I, I shared with you that I had to own being an idiot. You know, I'd spent a lot of my life being self-righteous and my dad used to call me a know-all, know-nothing when I was a kid. And he was absolutely right. I remember years later, as I started to do the work on myself, looking at that statement and thinking, he was trying to tell me something, right? Mm -hmm. And he was just trying to tell me that, you know, be careful with being a know-all yeah. because that really is a self-righteous stand and someone will come along and pull you off your perch yeah. if you're going to be like that and you'll be wondering why. Um, and being a know-nothing, well, knowing nothing, I mean, that's what Buddhas and all sorts of different kind of, you know, um, gurus talk about mm -hmm. is that you've got to, you know, have space for something else so you know nothing as well. Mm -hmm. well and I learned that lesson 15 years ago in an experience where I needed to own being an idiot. Mm -hmm. 
And I could see why, and I'm not going to go into the whole situation now, but, you know, I had to own being an idiot. And I can tell you, being an idiot is so liberating. <laughs> you know, you, you don't have to be smart at anything. <laughs> and when, when you're not smart at anything, it's amazing how many people just step in and take over and do everything for you. Because <laughs> they're so busy trying to prove how smart they are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it was, and also being the idiot or the fool has been a really nice fallback position sometimes in my life. It certainly takes the pressure off. Like, yeah. That's so much pressure to prove, to be, to whatever. And as soon as you step into the fool, it, I mean, there's a reason it's even in the tarot, right? The fool card. Um, yes. You know, and it is about you step aside and you don't get washed away in the insanity you know, of the mind. Yes. Because I, I could, I could, gosh, I could just name all these different situations in my life where, you know, I'd start to catch myself. As soon as I was about to declare that I was right about something, I'd have this knowing, this funny feeling that if I made that declaration, I was going to get proven wrong. Yeah. yeah. So I got smarter and smarter at just zipping it <laughs> and saying nothing <laughs> at all. And then I would look at the situation and go, oh, my gosh, I was going to be wrong. Mm. Yes. Life was really just trying to get me to pay attention to, you know, making declarations like that. Yeah, it, you know, um, and I suppose rethinking how I was going to then address future situations. Yeah. And I mean. Me to step it up. And it makes sense because your the power of your thinking, what you're thinking is creating well, is being reflected in your world. So if you're thinking and making declarations, you're thinking that you're above things. So therefore it's going to get manifested in your world, but it comes with the consequences attached to it, right? Well, it just closes off everything else. Yeah. So all I was getting was more of the same. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew that. I knew that, but it had to happen enough times for me to go, oh, something's not right here. Yeah. Something's not right with my thinking. So how, I mean, you've got thinking and then you've got speaking words out into the world. What do you see, like, is the speaking, the spells, the words that we're putting out in the world, are they just a magnification of the thinking? How can you separate them? I don't know. I think lots of stuff. It doesn't always come out of my mouth, though. Well, then I suppose what I would say is that we're here to bring things into form mm -hmm. and words are form. Yeah. Because the other thing I did find that, you know, you were talking about thinking and thinking and thinking, that if I didn't bring something out into form, whether just writing in a journal or writing a letter to somebody or having a conversation in some way, um, it would build in my mind instead. That's a good point because putting it into form would disempower it really. Release it. Release yes. it. Yeah, you're right. It would release it. Okay, that's cool. I'm having an epiphany moment. <laughs> <laughs> The light bulb just went off. <laughs> Sorry for the blinding light to everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And plus, if if the mind is left to its own devices, I've always said it's it's got a magnifying glass. And if you don't address whatever that issue is or that problem is or that whatever's on your mind, it does grow and it and it magnifies it, it out of proportion. It can okay. make a problem look like it's insurmountable if you give it weeks and months to do it. Yeah. Well, no ones that get to years is even worse. Yeah. Yeah. 
that if you actually, you know, work with the mind and release it in some way, shape or form, um, it, it takes all the pressure out of it. And, you know, that's a step towards you controlling the mind. Mm. <laughs> What, another light bulb? <laughs> oh, I'm just realising all these times that I'm like, I've got to work this out. I've got to sort this out. I've got to do this myself. It's like, it's just my mind keeping me in the loop. Yeah. You know, <laughs> instead of just going, hey, can you just bounce this with me? Or I'm going to sit down and write it out instead of just getting stuck in that perpetual loop. Well, that brings me to my little quote, my little Hellenism that I've always used. When you get it out, you work it out because it's the whole thing of everybody knows that if they've had something on their mind and then they go to somebody and they go, look, can I just talk to you about it? Just, I'm trying to work this out. And you get halfway through trying to tell the other person and all of a sudden you go, ah, oh, got it. <laughs> I got it. It's okay. I don't need to talk to you anymore. I've just figured it out. And all you've done is get half of it out. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And that for me is just validation that, yeah, we're here to put things into experience and into the world. Mm. Yeah. And that's a great example of how it happens. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think we've blown some brain cells out there now? I blow mine, so we're good. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe we shouldn't say we've blown some brain cells. We've probably lit up a hell of a lot more. I'd like to think of it that way. I think that's a much nicer thing. We've ignited some brain cells. How's that sound? Yeah. yeah I mean, if we, we're only using 5%, 10% of what we've got. Well, I, I think we're now we've turned another 5% on or something. That'd be good. <laughs> that's pretty impressive. <laughs> <laughs> You're only using five. We've doubled the capacity. <laughs> <laughs> See? The glass is half full, right? <laughs> Without a doubt. Oh, all right. Yeah. I think that wraps it all up. <laughs> I think it does. I think that's that's a lot, a it lot. Is. It is mm. absolutely. So yeah. put it into practice, guys. Think it through. Share it. Have conversations about it. Mm. Um, yeah, because that's how we work things out, right? Yeah, and that's I start think. We're... Seeing, sorry, start seeing how the power of your thinking turns up in your world. Yes. What were you going to say? I was going to say it just reminds me of the power of community, but like good quality community, um, people that will. That's, a, that's, a, that's another whole conversation. It is. It is. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that comes down to me going, like, like I won't have anyone in my world that doesn't have a good moral compass and good standards, high standards. Yeah. And, you know, because as soon as you require that, that's what starts turning up. Mm. It does. But it's not, an easy, it's not an easy thing to do. It's a whole other conversation because it comes right back to that whole thing of saying no to some people. Yes. No to some things. Yeah. And that's not always an easy thing to do. Absolutely. So we'll leave that for another time, right? <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much for tuning in and listening to us again. And I hope you actually go back and listen to this because I'm going to go back and listen to this again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Until next time. See you guys. Bye.